I learned by doing, uh, really. The experience is everything you need for that. That's why it's so important to work with senior engineers next to you. It's really important also to kind of like know what machines do they use to produce PCPs. You know, how does a pick and place machine work? And maybe go see one uh, if you can. Today I speak with Alberto Gianelli, Senior Electronic Engineer at Teenage Engineering. Have you seen a gray mechanical key style pocket synth come up in your Instagram reels or TikTok feeds? After a quick Google search of Teenage Engineering's Op1 portable synthesizer, it's more than a possibility. Their whimsical design is simply irresistible, and once you see one product, you can't help but look into their entire collection. Across their team are multi-hyphenate engineering creatives who bring an interdisciplinary edge to developing electronic products for sound and music. Alberto is one of these dynamic contributors. So what goes on in Teenage Engineering's creative and development process? How do they stand out against larger competitors as a smaller studio? And how do they make sure their gear goes from idea to completion and finally in the hands of basement producers, music influencers, and professional studios everywhere? We'll cover these topics and more. Let's get into it. We live in a time where design and technology touch every aspect of our lives. But where did it all come from? Who designed it? How is it built and brought to market? What will it look like in a year? Two years? A hundred years? From the phones and smartwatches that help us in our day to day to the cutting edge spaceships and 3D printers that are leading us into the future, modern design is constantly shaping the way we work, communicate, problem solve, and play. And every new design, big or small, starts with an idea and a bill of materials. I'm Magenta Strongheart, and this is The Bomb, where we talk to leading innovators in the tech world and celebrate the transformational power of design. Welcome to The Bomb. Alberto, I'm so excited to have you here today. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm really good and really excited to be here with you. Yeah, it sounds like it's been a busy time for you at Teenage Engineering. Uh, yeah. Um... Recently, we released our new, or we announced our new uh, condenser microphone, CM15, uh, that I've been working on it for a while. So it was a big moment and um, um, a lot a lot to do. And a relief probably to have it out there, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a good relief. It's a good relief, yeah. What kind of music do you make? Uh, that's the hardest question. <laughs> um, Sorry, I didn't prepare you for that one. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> Uh, I make electronic music. Uh, I'm very influenced by like Detroit and my Chicago house. Awesome. I'm actually in Michigan right now. I'm going to Detroit tomorrow. So perfect ah, connection. <laughs> I love that place. It's a crazy place. I really miss yeah. it. I've been there once. It's, it was a good experience. So maybe that's a good segue to rewind a little bit and give our audience a little bit of background. Uh, can you start by introducing your role at Teenage Engineering? What's your title and what kind of work do you do there? Yeah, I'm currently an electronic engineer at Teenage. Um, I do um, mostly hardware design, which means um, I take care of the whole um, schematics and PCB layout and production of the electronic circuit boards that are inside our products. Uh, this is uh, my main focus, but I would say at Teenage, everyone kind of has a multi-faced, if that's a word, a role. Like you need to be a bit flexible and you, um, I personally help also with a little bit of product development and seeing the project as a final, visualizing already the user and uh, the user interface, and uh, because I'm, I use synthesizer. I make music myself, so it's very easy for me to understand if you know that ADC, for example, is is worth for this type of product, uh, or or you know. So it's quite. I, I'm quite connected also to the final user experience, but electronic engineer, I would say. Yeah. yeah, that's probably really valuable to have that perspective uh, to be also the end user in some cases, right? Or know maybe what they're looking for in a product. I'm sure that that's super valuable. Do most of your team share that? Are there other um, music no, makers yeah. and musicians or is it kind of unique to you and some, you know, a select few? It's a mix. Uh, not everyone is. Uh, 
there are certain people that are really good uh, at a specific uh, the specific task. But yeah, I mean, I think it's useful that some people have this uh, interest um, and they understand deeply also from a user perspective what we are designing. Um, so many, so many times, especially in big companies, you 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 execute a task, an engineering task that gives you some sort of reward and and and, and stimulation, uh, but you don't really get maybe um, I assume. Um, the big machine, the big view, you know, and I, totally. I, I really, I really want to have that um, because then you, then you make better choices, uh, but sometimes it's just not possible, you know, for structures. And that makes sense. If you're just like such a small step in the larger picture that you can't, you almost can't zoom out and see it all in its entirety, or you're focused on so many small steps for so many different projects that are huge and going to, you know, be connected to other departments at a giant company, you don't get that same sort of like intimate connection exactly. from the idea to the final product and the final application. I can appreciate that definitely. Yeah. And so when it comes to teenage engineering, I'm really interested kind of, I know this is a little bit different than some of the questions we had talked about. So I hope you're cool with just going for it, but I'm interested in kind of this discussion around you know, from uh, engineering and design in school to an app actual, you know, working for an actual company, producing actual products, the learning curve of, I think also design for manufacture is a huge part of that. Because when we're in school, we don't necessarily, we maybe, you know, we do these one-off projects. We're not thinking about scalability, about working with contract manufacturers. So what was that process like to really learn that? And, um, what, you know, is that a part of the process you enjoy now? Or is it you dread it? How do you kind of feel about the design for manufacture? Does it take away from the creativity or it's an interesting kind of puzzle to solve? Yeah. Um, so I learned by doing, uh, really. Uh, in the beginning, I didn't even know what it was and that you actually, as you said, in school, you don't learn that. Uh, you simply don't learn it. And I personally didn't even learn how to lay out a pcb pro properly for example you know um and 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 that that's part of studying while working and also that's why it's so important to work with senior engineers next to you that they've done that for many years and that was my case so when it when it comes to actually make a product manufacturable or actually already thinking about you know standardization and um making the product manufacturable the experience is it's everything you need for that or you know you can't study those things i guess you can study that but i would say most of most of most of the people just learn it by doing it and also reading the eq and the dfm reports from the factories it's like hey you can't do this this is too close this is too sharp you know and and then asking yourself okay why is that and then, and the answer maybe comes from the mechanical department and they say, oh, because they use a CNC machine for that. And, and then you learn what's a CNC machine. So it's really important also to kind of like know what machines do you use, do they use to produce PCBs? You know, how does a pick and place machine work? And maybe go see one uh, if you can. Um, so at that, that's really, I think, I don't know who role is it, but I would say is the role of the company to educate a junior engineer to these things. Um, and I think Teenage did it very well with me. Uh, they've been producing electronics for a long time, so they're very aware of DFM uh, design. So I learned that there. It's fun. I mean, I wouldn't say it's fun. I think it's it's a good it's a good thing to know because that's actually, you know, it's a tool that. It's useful um, and good to know since the beginning, since you're when you're starting designing. Definitely. That's something we discuss a lot is kind of, I don't think it's ever too early to think about the full life cycle of the product designed for sustainability and designed for scalability, because otherwise you're going to have to go through so many new, you know, future design cycles if you have to go back 
you didn't think, you know, maybe big picture enough or you didn't think about the long term um, producers or manufacturers of the product. And then you have to go through these redesigns. Sometimes they're unavoidable. So we all know that's part of the process. But if you can, um, you know, think ahead on some of those things, then it can really pay off in the end. And I think the more, like you said, the more experience kind of hands on opportunity you get to learn those things, the more it's going to stick and you'll be able to to use them for future roles, future products, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. Um, how long are usually the kind of product design cycles that you guys go through at Teenage Engineering? You mean time-wise or? Yes, time-wise. It can vary a lot, you know, like, mm, I would say Teenage is a, is a bit of a special company. There are a lot of projects ongoing all the time and a lot of projects they have been, you know, sleeping maybe for a couple of years um, and and then, or for many years, like they were before. It was since, you know, first concept to mass production was seven years on and off. Oh, wow. So it can really, it can really depend. Um, mm-hmm. But normally, I mean, you need a couple of years, you, you know, it depends, depends on resources. And usually our resources are quite limited for the complexity of things we do. Uh, like we work in group in small groups, so it depends. I would say at least you know two three years uh, for idea, you know, from idea to to mass production depends on the product, depends on the complexity. Um, but yeah, rough years. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense, definitely. <laughs> and I'd be interested. How does that compare to? Before you started working at this company, is that what you expected as far as, you know, in your experience, in your education, is that kind of what you would imagine the timeline or was it kind of an adjustment or surprising going from, um, you know, school and internships and previous experiences into like a real uh, production life cycle and timeline? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I was surprised on how many projects you know, we were doing at the same time, uh, production line wise, um, or like production time wise. Yeah, I guess I wasn't super surprised because I was very open. I didn't have, um, I didn't know, I didn't have um, previous knowledge of it. Um, yeah, I was more surprised than some project can sleep for so many years and then suddenly, you know, come back. And so um, it was interesting you p- brought up the uh, the pick and place, being able to see a pick and place in person. That's something huge we also emphasize at Design Lab. We love have it. We have a very small pick and place compared to the ones they have in the factories. But we've learned that it can be really, um, you know, really make a difference for someone's education. We have industrial design students, EEs, um, different, you know, mechanical engineering, et cetera, students come through and they maybe seen a video of one or something, but to see it in person and actually see, you know, how it operates, how the components are fed, et cetera, I think just really, you know, can kind of turn on a light bulb for students and thinking about that big picture, um, you know, design for manufacture and all those processes, like you said, all the tools you may have to use or learn about or have access to in the future. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think that should be done in schools. The thing is, the field of engineering, it's so vast, uh, or, or, or the field of electronic engineering, at least, uh, it, it, it's it's massive. So I understand why maybe, you know, it, it, it's, it's a bit rare to find it in school. And you're supposed to learn it if you get into that, if you're interested in manufacturing uh, and manufacturing electronic goods. So it's really useful also to be there in the factory and talk to the operators. That's that's really important. Definitely. So teenage engineering, I think, is really special because of how kind of playful and whimsical the projects can be and still highly technical, of course, and get the job done that you want them to be able to do. And I would love to just hear more about kind of the creative process. Where do the ideas come? I thought that the uh, choir release last fall was really awesome and uh, would just love to learn about how you all uh, kind of develop these ideas? Where do they come from? And how does, you know, how do you think the founders or the the leaders at the company keep it creative and playful and an opportunity to explore these kinds of ideas? Yeah. So uh, the, uh, I want to start from the choir. The choir was actually the really first project of T ever at Teenage um, in back in 2000, between 10 and 
12. I'm not the right person to to talk about this, but I just want to mention that that was a, that's an example of a project that started so many years ago, and it got released also re recently. And um, that started as a commission, I think, uh, and it was their first project. I'm not sure, but it could have been like a collaboration with Absolute Vodka, uh, where okay. they w where they commissioned um, like a singing choir. Uh, but but mm, going back to the general creative process, I still need to understand it myself, <laughs> in the sense that uh, I, I'm joking. Uh, I would say <laughs> most of the ideas come from from um, from Jasper, which is our CEO and head of design, and and this should let us think that Teenage is actually a design company. Uh, design comes first uh, in most cases. I think that's really apparent in the work. You know, yeah. that speaks for itself. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's it's very. There is no a specific process where we create ideas, but I would say a lot of idea comes from from Jasper and the design team and. Um, it can be sometimes is is driven just by creativity. Like um, I remember one one day, like uh, coming in on a Friday, um, uh, and we were just discussing, and uh, Jesper was talking a little bit uh, with me and David, and he was like, "Wouldn't it be cool to make this uh, this thing?" Uh, and he described something, and then on Monday. He arrived with like so many renders of, of, oh, of wow. that thing, <laughs> just and like that. And then we started making it. Yeah, and then we started making it, and and that can become a pro a project, and and a product that we released. Um, mm -hmm. The TX six mixer was very much like that type, and then of course I'm not the right person to ask um, because I I would say I'm not part of the. Uh, creative oscillator. I'm a little bit more like a filter. So like <laughs> I can maybe, uh, you know, uh, filter some things or, or maybe propose some things. That's a very diplomatic way to describe the engineer and design relationship. <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, I, I mean, of course, uh, it, it's an open, it, it, you know, the office is, is one, one big office space. So like, you know, you could walk to anyone and say, "Hey, what about this? Uh, what about that idea?" What about... And and then the decision making is also driven by other factors, uh, of course, uh, that are not creative, maybe, and deadlines and budget and etc. But I would say it's quite it's quite free and um, it's def definitely design first. Um, but that's all I can all I can say, really. Um, Thank you for sharing. I think that probably a lot of designers and engineers can kind of relate to what you're talking about as far as the collaborative experience. And and I feel like that's one of the magical things about working at a smaller company. Like you said, you know, you can work on some projects simultaneously. You're involved in multiple parts of the process. You get to see the big picture. And also you can see even where these ideas are coming from, whereas I think you know, at a much larger company, sometimes you get you miss some of those serendipitous moments or opp uh, opportunities yeah. for collaboration because things are so siloed, and um, you know you're only working on such a small part of the process potentially. Yeah, totally. And uh, I think it's it's really cool and creative to be able to say, "Hey, I have this idea. Can I try making it?" Uh, yes, no. Um, Maybe uh, it, it, <laughs> yeah, it's I like be super empowering. Of, yeah, yeah. Um, regarding the production process, um, it was quite. It was. It made sense, you know. Like it made sense for the resources we have and for the factories, and it kind of made sense. But you don't really understand uh, until it's done. Until until. Until you do it, and until until you go and see how you know, like a production line works, and and then you realize that there are that that every little bit needs to make sense, and you know there is no space for anything that you didn't think about because it's gonna pop up later, you know. Uh, so it, it's really good to see the whole process. Definitely. It was it was more like a a learning experience more than a surprise. Mm hmm. That makes sense. Things are so different, I feel like, in in industry and in like commercial applications versus 
when we were in school. <laughs> I can say yeah, that for yeah. sure. Yeah, oh, totally. Totally. So back to uh, kind of design for manufacture. Another big part of the process uh, is sourcing, of course, part of mm. project management and the, like you said, kind of product development, bigger picture beyond just some of the engineering sourcing. I think one of the most maybe one of the least favorite topics for a lot of businesses and engineers, <laughs> especially in the last few years. Um, but I would love to hear, you know, how um, you all at Teenage Engineering, you know, kind of work through sourcing challenges. If you have any anecdotes of experiences you guys have had in the last few years, did you ever have to do a redesign because of a missing component or something that you couldn't get access to? And what's that process like? Yeah, so, um, well, currently we have the luck of having a sourcing specialist with us, uh, Joachim, that does an amazing job sourcing components uh, for uh, in parallel for every project and make sure we have stocks and et cetera. And we have a, we have a separate production department for that. Um, so I used to, when I started, deal a little bit more with the sourcing myself but i th i would say that that department then it took more shape especially because of the crisis we needed more resources on sp that specific side so but i can tell i mean during the pandemic was of course a huge problem uh like most of um most of uh, electronic companies um and um yes we had to redesign uh, yes, we had to swap uh, chips. Uh, we had to we had to redesign products that you know we had, we had to redesign to keep alive products um, and uh, and to make products. And that was as a as a engineer was so frustrating because it's like it's almost like saying okay you're 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 an artist and you want to paint a, you know like you want to do a drawing or something you want to paint. A, piece of art and, and you get only like three colors out of 15. You can't use purple. It's gone. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's such a, it was such a, a annoying. Um, so we basically, uh, from a designer perspective, we made sure that the first thing we had to check back then was that that part was either in stock or in, in our stock or deeply available. And uh, I mean, there were different tactics. We try to, you know, buy, uh, for example, if there is a new project that is burning, before even starting production, we buy all the parts first. Um, and there was one project that is in that is in development now. That uh, that it's been that uh, that we did like that, you know, uh, because that was the only. Um, guarantee that we could actually produce that otherwise it's it's so many hours of development that just go out the window uh, because then you can source component and um, especially with semiconductors you know re replaceability is not that straightforward it's not just another resistor or another capacitor um, it, it can actually bend the product and you, you might you might need to find work around that are not optimal um etc um but that was kind of challenging also in a way it was of course you have a limit you know you know you, know, you have to be creative you have few few choices design parameters uh, right <laughs> yeah but but that's Just not what you not the design parameter you want you know <laughs> there are already enough i would say <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, so yeah i mean we had to redesign and also we had to at Teenage, we have direct contacts with the manufacturers, uh, and that was also really helpful. But I mean, during the pandemic, they were also very uncertain about the future. Uh, so uh, now it's getting a bit better, but yes, redesign, yes, big troubles. But I mean, it kind of slowed down and it didn't, it didn't definitely didn't kill us. It just, you know, we had to settle. Had to adapt. Bit. Yeah. Yeah, adapt, definitely. Yes. Definitely. Yeah, and I mean, I'm very, you know, I f I have an approach that every product, every project is different. 
even if, of, of course, there are best practices and the optimal design, I think it's tuned to the single product. Um, so I think there would be, of course, maybe a very good result, but I, I, I'm a bit skeptical to think that there would be the optimal design. You know what I mean? Definitely. Do you work on uh, outside projects from work very often, like kind of just passion projects or things that you're interested in yeah, developing? Sometimes. sometimes, but it's hard to find the time. And I mean, definitely. <laughs> sure, but I, I kind of, I more like dream about about it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I feel you on that. Same. Same. Absolutely. When it comes to woodshop projects. I wish I was, uh, I have a lot more ideas and designs and sketches than actual things I've yeah. been able to make in the last few years, but that's the struggle, I mean, I, right? <laughs> sometimes I repair my synthesizers. I have some like old synths and, you know, maybe mod them a little bit and restore old tape machine, things like that. I like to do sometimes. Well, that's good. Keeps it kind of fresh, right? <laughs> yeah. We're, you know, getting tight on time here, so I'm going to speed through some of the next couple questions. But uh, the way that Alberto and I met was through um, the Hackaday Prize a few years back. And you were one of our fabulous judges. Thank you again for your time <laughs> and contributions to the Hackaday Prize. You. It's, you know, it's really not possible without every different part, not only the participants, but also our judges and our mentors. So I'd love to hear, you know, I have to do obviously a little bit of a shameless plug here because the Hackaday Prize is back. It's year 10 and we're just uh, in the middle of challenge two now. And so I'd love to hear from, you know, your perspective, what you thought about the experience, how you felt about some of the projects. Uh, and yeah, yeah, the experience of judging. I mean, it was really cool. I didn't even know that it existed, uh, honestly. Uh, <laughs> so when I when I got to know it, it was, I mean, I would I would have loved to have participated myself when I was like a student. Um, the judging was very smooth, and I think it was like very or very well organized. Um, oh well, thank you. <laughs> no, it was it was really really smooth and. Um, I don't have a memory of a specific project, uh, but I, I remember a little bit the feeling of, uh, you know, picking your favorite one and like understanding. It was almost like watching a competition in TV uh, a little bit. And uh, with the difference that it was deeply uh, inspiring and it was good to see that it was uh, an attention to the environment too. You know, all these projects were... Um, meant to have the environment and uh, um, collect data. Um, so yeah, it, it was fun. It was fun. It was a um, fun experience. Um, I would love to do it again. And um, also one other thing that I remember was I had the feeling that there were so many different level of experiences in the projects. Like I remember there was like a, like a really good and in-depth and well done project and also like maybe a little bit like a beginner projects uh, that I had to judge. And um, that was good because you can see that there are different participants, you know, it's not, it's, I mean, I assume it's quite open. Um, so that was, that was good to see. Yes, totally. No, I love that point. It's something actually we've gotten feedback from some judges that it makes it more challenging to have such a range, you know, of projects kind of sophistication levels. But I do think, like you said, it speaks to, it's very open. We want anyone yeah. to feel like they can enter. And because we have the different award levels, you know, each challenge, right. there'll be top 10 finalists that get $500. So there's a lot wider of a range of projects that could qualify for that versus, you know, of course, the grand prize, we expect really thorough documentation, you know, uh, reproducibility and all these different things that might be, you know, slightly higher caliber expectations. But we really try to give opportunities to each stage of a project or education level or experience level. So I appreciate you recognizing that. Yeah, that's you should keep doing that, I think. <laughs> yeah, we're excited that it's year 10 and, you know, we're only about a quarter of the way through now, I guess. I'm trying to think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, until November, but excited to see where it goes. It's always fun to follow along where the finalists develop and, and who gets, you know, the grand prizes at the end of the year. So I'm curious, this is kind of a sidetrack question, but what software do you use for your PCB layout and design? We use Altium. Okay, nice. Yeah. 
That makes sense. Um, we were just talking with a guest on the podcast a couple weeks ago who is uh, a startup developing um, AI PCB layout software called oh, yeah. Quilter. It's going to be interesting to see how it evolves. <laughs> I'm excited to follow yeah. along the jury because I think everyone, you know, AI is everywhere, of course, very trendy yeah. these days. It's a buzzword. Yeah. People are thinking about all the different worlds it's going to influence and change. But you, it was interesting to see your reaction. You were immediately like, no. <laughs> yeah, I don't think, honestly, like, I think it's, it's a, uh, I mean, AI PCB layout. Yeah, sure. I mean, <laughs> it, it can work. Uh, but I don't know. Oh, wow. I, I mean, there's so many decisions that, that go further from math uh, and mm, I don't know. <laughs> There's like an it's intuition, I think, about it. it yeah, it, it's very intuitive sometimes and it depends also on the mechanical yeah, engine, you know, the mechanical engineering of the products. But I mean, I'm super interested. Um, I'm super interested in seeing where, where can we go there? Um, yeah. But it's very, it feels like it's very trendy now. So I, I try not to, I'm not, I don't want to be attracted to that yet, you know? <laughs> Definitely. Only time will tell. But it was interesting to hear what the founder was saying about the, you know, the layouts that it's pr produced so far. Some of the ways that the initial layouts will come out are very, um, uh, like very unique and unusual compared to what we're used to seeing now. Like there, um, some, there's a lot more curved traces, for example, which people mm. rarely do that. And he was just talking about how maybe to a certain extent, we've done something, you know, the same way for so long. And of course had senior engineers and designers pass down best practices for so long. Maybe there is an opportunity for technology to help us rethink some things that could be maybe, you know, optimized or more efficient, but sometimes we have a bias of the practices we're used to, right? Like you said, the intuitive nature of, you know, this works, so we did it this way, it made the most sense this way, et cetera. But like we said, we'll just have to see where it goes. How was, the, how was it called, the, um, this project, oh, it's, the it's, AI? It's called Quilter, and I can actually, um, I can help get you access to a beta um, mm. license basically, you know, or something that you can try it out because they really want to get everyone's feedback, you know, so okay. the founder is very approachable and, and I can introduce y'all because I think right now it's behind, um, you know, an access wall or something. Yeah, I understand. That's, so it's that cool to keep an eye it. on this and see. And yeah, see they want to see, yeah. you know, the feedback for the experience and stuff. But yeah, it'll be interesting nice. to see where it goes. Yeah. We're going to wrap it up with just a few questions that we ask all of our guests here. What's mm. something that's inspiring you in technology these days? It's not, not AI, AI, clearly. No, I'm just going to say <laughs> jinx. <laughs> uh, actually, I mean, I'm actually quite, I, I, I'm recently reading a lot of like old articles from the 70s about valves. <laughs> oh, about, interesting. Uh, like, like vacuum tubes and you know in audio they have this magic uh you know uh this magic saturation that uh, makes uh warm sound and i'm mm -hmm. i'm actually studying that you know a little bit how it works a little bit more in depth uh, and maybe how to reproduce it with different technology so uh, yeah i definitely i tend to get inspired from old stuff uh for some reason so i would say vacuum tubes currently Nice. I can relate to that yeah. for sure. And you should definitely check out, there are some vacuum tube projects on Hackaday. So maybe there'll be something worthwhile mm. exploring on there. All right. And last but not least, what is on your personal bill of materials? Oh, yeah. That is interesting. Uh, I'm going to interpret the question my, my own way. Uh, for sure, a good kitchen knife. Love uh, that. Uh, that know. is a new <laughs> answer. We haven't heard that yet. Um, uh, because, you know, you have to you need that if you want to cook. You need food, a good knife, you know, definitely. like a good knife. Um, it's dangerous no, but, not to have um, a sharp knife. Exactly. <laughs> um, my person below material, a caliper. Uh, that's super useful. I use it daily almost. You mean about like, you know, electronics or? 
my my whole it's however okay, you want to take it it's open question <laughs> mm -hmm. um a clock uh like a watch some sort of like time tracking um mm -hmm. what else shoes uh like comfortable shoes um and slippers in the office if you know that makes slippers in the thing, office actually. also a new answer <laughs> not sleep yeah exactly <laughs> slippers in the office um and um i love this salia sale is called i think with uh, it's the logic analyzer uh okay. sale sale mm -hmm. uh, logic analyzer it's super small and very useful i use it a lot uh developing um and uh what else <laughs> oh earplugs 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 yeah to just kind of like zone out i try to always keep earplugs in my backpack just like for emergencies and one time it really came in handy because my i was pulling into the um parking lot at my apartment a couple years ago and the um there was like an alarm that wouldn't turn off and I was having to move a bunch of stuff from like my trunk to my apartment. So I had to do a bunch of trips, but it was late and someone, you know, the maintenance person or whatever couldn't turn off the alarm. I don't know. is taking forever. So I just put my earplugs in and was able to do it. And I was like, I'm so glad I kept these earplugs in my backpack. So I think that's a good pro tip. Definitely. That's my complete bill of material. Uh, that That's all I need to survive that was great. I think covers a good range of the necessities <laughs> to get through the day or through the week. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much for the time today, Alberto, and looking forward to um, hopefully inviting you back to be a Hackaday Prize judge. As you mentioned, we'd love to have you back. So I'll hit you up next thank year. Thank you, Magenta. And um, really great to catch up with you today. Super good. Good to talk to you and to, yeah, to meet you also. That was my discussion with Alberto Gianelli. You can find out more about teenage engineering in the show notes. Thanks for listening and until next time. If you like The Bomb, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and share the show wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow Supply Frame and Hackaday on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Design Lab at Supply Frame Design Lab on Instagram and Twitter. The Bomb is a Supply Frame podcast produced by me, Magenta Strongheart, and Ryan Tillotson. Written by Maggie Bulls and edited by Daniel Ferreira. Theme music is by Anna Hogben. Show art by Thomas Schneider. Special thanks to Giovanni Salinas, Bruce Dominguez, Thomas Woodward, Jin Kumar, Jordan Clark, the entire Supply Frame team, and you, our wonderful listeners. I'm your host, Magenta Strongheart. See you next week.